Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Welcome to our worship service. This is the word of the Lord from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I call to you, Yahweh. Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Yahweh, if you considered sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. I wait for Yahweh. I wait and put on my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for there is faithful love with the Lord, and with him is redemption in abundance, and he will redeem Israel from all its sins. This is the word of the Lord.
find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, I'm desperate for you, I'm desperate for you, I surrender. was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is always good to be together with the people of God. It's always good to be able to worship the Lord our God and to express to Him our adoration, our praise, our thanksgiving, to pour our hearts out before Him, to let Him address the needs of our lives. And we're here today for those very reasons, 
and many, many more. We'll continue our study this morning in the book of Philippians. We've been in chapter 2 the last couple of weeks. We're going to pick up in verse 12 this morning. If you have your copy of the scripture, you may want to open it there and go ahead and mark that because we will be there for the rest of the morning. Scripture begins as Paul continues speaking to the church with these words, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. I know you probably didn't hear that when I want to read it again. I'm just kidding you. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Last week, we ventured into the passage of Scripture that is among one of the greatest and most significant passages of Scripture in the Bible, what's called the canonic passage, the passage that speaks about the self-emptying of the Lord Jesus, where where Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, encourages believers to let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, we talked about that as the supreme objective for the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I talk, as I began the message last week, I talked about uh, the, the phrase that we use sometimes to describe a position that we've come to that is beyond our ability or desire to be moved from it when we say, I have made up my mind. Most of you have said that statement at some point about something that's happened in your life. I've made up my mind. And what you're saying is, that's just the way it's going to be. That's the decision I've made, and that's where I'm going to stand. Now, this morning, I want to talk about another compelling statement for just a moment that's similar, but a little bit different. And it talks about the mind, and Paul has talked about that a good bit in this passage. And it's the, the simple phrase that many of you may have heard or maybe even used in the, the, the rearing of children or in the growing up as a child, whenever you've heard these words or said these words, you better mind me. Anybody ever heard those words? I heard them a lot growing up. You better mind me. And, and I didn't really understand what that meant, except that I knew that it meant that I should probably do whatever it was I was being told. But as I've looked at that statement and thought about it for a few moments, it, it sometimes may not seem to fit, but it really does. Because what, what, what's really meant by that statement is this. I want you to get your mind on what my mind is on. I want you to have the same mind that I have about this. So you better mind me. You better come to the place where your mind adjusts to what I'm trying to convince you is right. And that's, that's a little bit of what Paul is saying here when he says, have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. You need to get your mind in sync with the mind of the Lord Jesus. So last week we talked about Jesus moving along that path of self-emptying, that that path that brought him to the place where he took on the form of a bondservant, the form of flesh, and, and became in appearance as a man. But then it also talks about that path taking him to a place where it says he humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient. Now, now, that's a critical word in this passage because if you, if you remember, as we read a few moments ago in verse 12, Paul talks again about that reality, that experience called obedience or obeying. And, and so whenever we look at what, what the, the end run of Jesus' emptying of himself was, it was that he became obedient even unto death, the death on the cross. But obedience was what took him there. Obedience was what brought him to the fulfillment of the Father's will and the Father's plan for His life when He came to this planet. And I want to suggest to you this morning that obedience will likewise take us to the place of the the fulfillment of the Father's will and plan for our lives while we walk this journey of faith on this planet. And so I told you that, that this 
admonition, this assertion, this declaration by the Apostle Paul to have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, is the supreme objective, and it's delineated there in that passage. But this morning I want to tell you that just knowing what the supreme objective is, is not enough. The supreme objective to have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, must also be pursued by those who are the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. There has to be some attempt, some desire, some determination, some drive on our part to achieve this supreme objective, to find ourselves having this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I submit to you this morning, based on the, the, the end of Jesus' humiliation, the end of His submission as obedience, I submit to you this morning the opportunity for achieving this objective for the follower of Christ is through obedience. The way that we will come to the place in our lives where we have the same mind, the mind in us, it's also in Christ Jesus, is whenever we learn what obedience is really all about. So Paul goes back in this passage to that very important word, and as he's identified the mindset of Jesus as obedience, now he identifies the objective of the believer as being accomplished through that same path, obedience. Look at what he says. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whenever Paul continues speaking to these believers that, are, that, are, that bring so much joy to his life, these believers that, that have so many times gotten it right in their fellowship of the Lord Jesus, he speaks to them and he says, as, as he addresses them, he says, my beloved. And, and so as he, as he speaks to them in those, that tone, you can see that there's something about what he's going to say that is encouraging to Paul. And, and so he says, you who I love so dearly have demonstrated obedience, not just when I'm here, but also when I'm gone. He affirms their obedience. So we see that under Paul's understanding of the way the Christian life is lived, that obedience is commendable. It's something that Paul is commending in their lives. And he begins by the praise of their obedience. He praises them for their obedience. Now, I don't know how many of you have pets, but I know that if you do, that there are certain behaviors that you want, want them to perform in their lives. You probably want them to let you know when they need to go outside or things like that. And so normally whenever those things begin to happen and you begin to teach them and train them and you bring them to a point where they become obedient about those things, it pleases you. And you praise them for their obedience, often giving them some sort of a reward, some sort of a treat, because they've learned to practice obedience. Well, Paul is actually here commending the believers of the church at Philippi because of their obedience, and he's praising them for the consistency of their obedience. He says, you have always obeyed. Now, how many times have you ever been able to say that about anyone or anything, even yourself? that you've always obeyed. Paul says your obedience is a consistent part of your life. And he says you've done that whether he's there, whether he's not. Obedience for them was a pattern of behavior that they had begun to incorporate in their life and include in their life. It was their theme song, if you will. And so Paul rejoices here in their obedience. He found joy in their obedience. And I'm going to say this to you as well. They also found joy in their obedience. And I'll tell you how I know that. It's because of what Paul is going to continue to tell us and teach us in this passage. So he praises them for their obedience. But then he also speaks to them about the power of obedience in their lives. This next phrase is very interesting. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now that's, that's an interesting passage because we all know that uh, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, that our salvation is not something that happens by works, right? It's, and, and, and he says to, in, in the book of Titus, as he writes that letter to him, not by works of righteousness as you've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And so we know that our salvation is something that we don't receive. It's not something that we gain. It's not something that becomes our reality through works that we perform. It's by the grace of God. 
We receive our salvation by the grace of God. So when he says, work out your salvation, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the, the pursuit of this, this relationship into which God has called us, this, this saving faith into which God has called us. He says, you work that out. You pursue that. And then he comes back to say that it's this cooperative venture. He says, what you need to understand is that you're working out something that God is working into you. He says, God is at work in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. So God's working in your life. God's busy in your life. God's conforming you to the image of His Son. God's changing you. God's sending you. God's purposing your life. And He says, as God works in you, then you're to work that out of your life. You're to let that flow out from your life. Y- y'all know what the, the words, when, you, when somebody says, I'm going to go work out or I'm going to work out, you know what they're saying, don't you? They're saying, I'll see you later because I'm not going with, you know, <laughs> Basically, they're, 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 saying, they're saying, I'm going to go exercise. And that's sort of what Paul is saying here. He says, you have this faith. You have this, this relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't let it stagnate. Don't let it just sit there. Exercise it. Work it out. Work that relationship with God. He's working in you, so let it work out of you into this world. And so he says there's a power that, that God gives you to work out the salvation to do it with fear and trembling, to do it with seriousness, sincerity, seeking God, pursuing God. And and so he says, God's working in you. You put forth the effort and God is cooperating with us as we obey him. And, And as he works in us, we then work out our salvation, our faith, the grace that he's bestowed on us. And we do this through obedience. Now, we need to talk about obedience for a minute. Because I think as believers, sometimes we have a a concept about obedience that may be just a a, a shred distorted. And and I I really want us to think about this as as I believe Scripture wants us to understand it this morning. I don't know how it was with you, but for me, and this was many, many years ago, I I grew up as a child through the decade of of the 60s, and that was the 1960s, not the 1860s. I know y'all think I've probably been around a long time, but but it was the 1960s, and, and it seemed like, and, and some of you have been around that long and longer, but it, it seemed like to me that the places that we ended up attending in, in our church relationships and, and the places that we worship, the places that we serve, that, that the, 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 the way that the message from God's Word was presented with constancy in every single church that I ever went to, and we went to several as I was growing up, that, that there was this, this, this hellfire and brimstone presentation where the preacher would stand up and, and literally scream almost for an hour. And, and, and it was all about calling us out of sin, telling us how bad sin was and how bad we were because we sinned. And, and I, I acknowledge that. Scripture says my righteousness is as filthy rags before God, and I understand that. I do. And, and so, so there was there was this this almost this uh, this this beating us up with the sinfulness of our hearts, and these these men were sincere. They were sincere. They were godly. They were, and they knew they believed in what they were doing. But I'm going to tell you that that I lived a life of fearfulness. I lived a life of fearfulness, and for me, once I trusted Christ at a young age, then I began to hear these preachers not calling me from sin, but calling me from sins. And it was almost as if every single week there was some other sin that I needed to avoid, and and, and if I did this, I was bad. If I did that, I was not right. If I did this, I was sinful again. And and so for me, it was almost like there were these these two two columns on on a piece of paper and one of them was right and one of them was wrong and you have to check off every one you do on each one and and, and so it became this this behavior issue of uh, and and I figured out as a boy and then as a teenager that I had a rebellious heart and even, even though I had accepted Christ and trusted him to forgive me for my sin I realized that I wasn't able to check all those boxes on the right side every day and not check some on the other side every day and, and so I lived this life where my whole life, my whole understanding of obedience to Christ was this system of rules and regulations that, that you had to follow because somebody said there was a system of rules and regulations that you had to follow. And so if I didn't do that, I felt like I was, I was less than I should be. I felt, I felt 
like I was unclean. I felt like I was bad. And I lived my life growing up that way. That's how I understood obedience. And, and, and so I would go to church week after week, and I would hear these fine men, these wonderful men, scream about sin. And, 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 I, and I just believed that I was just always fighting against it and trying to find my way into what was right and, and not what was wrong, and that that was what the Christian life was all about. And that's how I understood obedience. And I want to tell you, it, it has taken decades of my life for me to come to a place where I've come to understand that the, whenever the Bible talks about obedience, it's not just talking about a system of rules and regulations. It's not just talking about a set of, of, of commandments or, or regulations that you have to follow in order to be right with God. And, 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 and don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I love the men that I grew up hearing preach the Word of God. And I honor them and I respect them. But that's the side of the gospel that I seem to hear all the time. And, and so I understood that, that obedience to Christ meant you figure out what's right, you figure out what's wrong, and you try to choose right, and if you choose what's wrong, you've done bad, and, and, you, and you need to, to, to get that right and be, and be done with it. And, and that's, that's, in some senses, that's a little bit right. But I, I rather think that obedience runs much deeper than that. See, I was, I was reading in this book, and I'm going I'm to just read this to you so that I don't... This is a book by Adrian Rogers, and Adrian Rogers is really a, an amazing man of God who, who walked with God while he was, he was uh, on this earth, and he, though dead, still speaks to many people many days. But he, he was talking about a, a conversation that he had with a guy whose name is Joseph Son. Joseph Son was a part of the Romanian revival, but before that he was, he was a part of the, the Romanian persecution whenever things were really bad over there, and he would preach the gospel, and he went through all kinds of, of difficulty, imprisonments and beatings and all kinds of things for his faith. And so after the liberation had occurred there, Adrian Rogers went over there to preach, and, and he tells this story. He says, as Joseph and I rode along in his car, I said, Joseph, tell me what you think about American Christianity. Now, you ask somebody who's been through what he had been through about American Christianity, you better be ready for an answer that might just challenge you a little bit. And he, he responded to Adrian, and he said, Adrian, I'd rather not, I'd rather not do that. And, a, and Adrian said back to him, he said, no, I want to know. He then said, well, Adrian, since you've asked me, I'm going to tell you. The key word in American Christianity is the word commitment. Would you all agree that's a pretty significant word in the Christian vocabulary of America? And Adrian said to him, that's good, isn't it, Joseph? And he replied, no, it's really not. He said, as a matter of fact, the word commitment did not come into great usage in the English language until about the 1960s. He said, in Romania, we do not even have a word to translate the English word commitment. He said, if you were to use commitment in your message tonight, I would not have a proper word to translate it with. Joseph continued, when a new word comes into usage, it generally pushes an old word out. And he says, I began to study and I found the old word for commit that, that commitment had replaced. Adrian, the old word that is no longer in vogue in America is the word surrender. He says, commitment has pushed the word surrender out of the Christian vocabulary in America. And he said, he said these words, he said, when you make a commitment, you're still the one in control. No matter how noble the thing you commit to. He said, one can commit to pray, study the Bible, give his money, commit to an automobile payment or to lose weight. He said, whatever he chooses to do, he commits to it. But he says, surrender is different. If someone holds a gun and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that person what you're committed to. You simply surrender and do what you're told. He said, Americans love commitment because they're still in control. But he said, the key word in the Christian life is the word surrender. He said, we're to be surrendered to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I see that as valid. I see that as an accurate assessment. And so what happens is we find ourselves in this place where, where we, we view obedience as a commitment that we can choose to make or not to make. And what Paul calls the church to and what Jesus calls us to as his followers is a life of absolute surrender where we absolutely 
reject any right to our own life. That's what Jesus did. He, he emptied himself of his authority, he emptied himself of his rights, and he took on the form of a bondservant. And so, and so he practiced obedience all the way to death, even death on the cross. Eugene Peterson talks about obedience in these terms. He, say, he sees obedience as, and listen to these words, as a lively, adventurous response of faith, not a stodgy plodding in the ruts of religion, but a hopeful race toward God's promises. We, he says we should never reduce obedience to the ritualistic keeping of a few commandments. And I submit to you that, that that's correct. See, what happens is that if we're not careful... We, we, we reduce our awareness, our understanding of what God wants to impart to us to, to one side and not the other. We, we reduce it to the receiving of the truth. And the truth is, is something we need. It's something we have to have. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. But, but, but they also, the Scripture also says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you what? Free. And who the Son makes free is free indeed. So, so we, we look for truth, but what happens is that sometimes if we just hold truth out there on its own, it, it can be pretty stark, it can be pretty cutting, and, and rightfully so. But I want to tell you something, that, that whenever God begins to reveal Himself to us, He doesn't put truth out there by itself. He puts truth out there, and then He puts mercy out there along with it. And so whenever we come face to face with the truth, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whenever we come face to face with the truth, that before God, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We also come face to face with the mercy of God that says, in spite of the fact that you deserve to be punished for your sin, I have sent someone who is your advocate, someone who is your sin bearer, and his name is Jesus. And when you place your trust and your faith in him, he carries your sin for you. And I distribute to you, instead of justice and judgment, I distribute to you mercy and grace and love. And that's the glory of God's salvation plan. He doesn't want us to live understanding that all He wants from us is for us to figure out the rules and, and, and to figure out when we make them and when we break them and to live this life of that. He wants us to move into a life of surrender to Him where we have this relationship with God that's based on love and mercy and grace where He can guide us with the internal presence of His Holy Spirit. And then once he does that, he moves us forward in his purpose and his plan before this world to be lights shining in the darkness in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. Oswald Sanders says these words. He says that the weakest saint can experience the power of the deity of the Son of God if once he is willing to let go. He says, any strand of our energy will blur the life of Jesus. We have to keep letting go and slowly and surely the great full life of God will in, infuse us in every part and men will take knowledge that we have been with Jesus. And that's what the world needs to hear. That's what the world needs to see. So I submit to you this morning that obedience is actually decided at the inner intersection of discipline and desire, where, where what we want to do is, is given over to the discipline of knowing that following God's way and God's will and God's word is ultimately more fulfilling and more satisfying than any rebellious act that we can perform where the knowledge of what is right cuts across my rebellious heart. And when this mind that I have in myself is submitted to the Lord Jesus and I begin to have the mind in me that's also in Christ, so that obedience becomes not this disappointed acquiescence for me not being able to do what I want to do and, and following the rules because I know that they're there, but it, it, it's an obedience that leads me into an intimacy and a greater interaction and a greater fulfillment in my faith experience than I could ever have without it. And that's what I seek. That's what I pursue. So obedience is commendable. It's a good thing. Secondly, obedience is consequential. Paul says this. He, he says do all this without complaining and disputing. And then he says, if you do, then you may become blameless and harmless children of God. Blameless and harmless children of God. There are consequences to obedience. What's, what are the consequences? You become blameless and harmless as a child of God. Blameless, 
That means that your, your, your purity is intact. Your holiness is, is undisputed. Harmless, you're not harming the cause of Christ. You're not bringing damage to, to the ministry, to the work, to the mission, to the purpose. So, so what, what happens is that whenever we begin to walk this path of obedience is that preservation is imparted to us. Preservation. What, is that, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, as he says, we're blameless. That means that our lives are preserved from spiritual rot. We, we still need to come back to the place where we understand that when we embrace a life of sinful behavior, whenever, whenever, we, whenever we choose that path over against the, the path of obedience, that spiritual rot sets into our lives. It, it corrupts. It, it destroys. It defaces us. It makes us less than the image of God, the imago Dei. It makes us less than God wants us to be. That's what Scripture means when it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's stamped His glory on us. And when we sin and choose sin and continue in sin, spiritual rot sets into our lives and begins to eat away at the purity and the holiness of our person and of the image of God within us. And harmless. Preservation from harming, from messing up from destroying the, the, the cause of the kingdom, from destroying our witness. We're not harming the witness of the testimony of who God is. It makes us distinct from the <clears throat> crooked and perverse generation that we walk through. So preservation is imparted. Secondly, proclamation is empowered. That's another consequence of obedience. He says, so that you will shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. Holding fast the word of life. The proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus is empowered as we walk the path of obedience. And that's important. It's important to ourselves, but it's more important to those who observe our lives and listen to our words and whose, whose lives are empty and whose hearts are desolate because they have no, no sense of who God is and they have no satisfaction of knowing what it means to be saved and forgiven and right in the sight of God. And, and, and so, so proclamation is essential to them. And our proclamation is empowered. We're like lights that, that shine in the dark place as we hold fast the word of life to this world that is so steeped in darkness and death. Obedience is consequential. So... As we think about this, obedience is the path that Paul challenges the Philippian believers to walk. And this morning is the path that I challenge you to walk, not because there's a rule that you need to keep or a rule that you might break, but because it moves you into the fullness of a, of a, of a relationship with Jesus that can only come through a surrendered heart. It moves you into a fullness of joy in knowing that you and Jesus are, are, are in sync you're one. You have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As you move forward in, in your journey of faith, it's, it's a blessed life, the life of obedience. It's not a burdensome life. It's not a life of toil and anguish because you, you slipped, you, 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 you stumped, stumped your toe, you stumbled. It's a life of rejoicing as you move forward and Christ leads you and guides you and loves you as you walk this journey of faith. So I want to leave you with just some things about obedience, just three very simple things that I want to remind you of that maybe will help you to plug these things into your life in a, in a more important and impressive way. The first thing is this. I want you to remember that obedience was modeled by the Lord Jesus. You say you want to follow Christ. You say you want to be like Jesus. Obedience was what He chose. Obedience was the path He walked. So if you want to be like Jesus... You need to submit yourself, surrender to an obedient life under Him. Secondly, I want you to understand that obedience has more to do with attitude than it does behavior. You know, you can, you can keep the rules and still have a stinky attitude. You know it? Is that, is, am I right about that? You know how I know that? I, I, you know, I, I'm telling you, when I was growing up, I know you don't believe this, but I had a little bit of a rebellious streak in me. And, and, and my parents could tell me to do something, 
And I might do it, but I'm like, I'm like the little boy that when his mother told him to sit down, he, he sat down finally, but he said, I may be sitting down in my body, but I'm standing up in my mind. <laughs> and, and here's the deal. Sometimes we, we can keep the rules. We can check all the boxes and look good, but in our minds we know that we're rebelling. And I want you to know that obedience has a lot more to do with your attitude than it does your behavior. Because if your attitude comes along, your behavior will follow. But it's not necessarily true the other way. The, the behavior needs to happen whether the attitude is there or not. But here's the deal. You need to get the attitude right. The attitude needs to be, I want to be like Jesus. I want Jesus to be the one that is before me as my example and the one that I love and the one I want to follow and be like. So it's more about attitude than behavior. Third thing is this, and, and I'll close with this and just momentarily. Obedience is the best way to achieve the uh, supreme objective for the follower of Christ. The supreme objective being what? Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The best way to get there is, is to practice obedience, to surrender your life, your heart, your all to the Lordship of Jesus. And to follow Him in love and, and in gratitude and, and to, to, to remember every day that in the Lord Jesus Christ, truth is revealed. In, the, in, the, in the, the Christ of the cross, truth is revealed that all have sinned and that all need a Savior. <clears throat> but also in the cross of Christ, the mercy of God is revealed because there He carries our sin. There He bears our punishment. <clears throat> the psalmist said it this way. He said, mercy and truth have kissed each other. And in the person of the Lord Jesus they have met face to face. Mercy and truth. The truth that we're sinners in need of a Savior. The mercy of God and that a Savior has been provided in the person of the Lord Jesus. Now maybe you're here this morning and you've always thought that, that walking with Christ was just about behavior. Just about you trying to be a person who performs more good things than you do bad things and that if the good things outweigh the bad things that at the end of the day, God will look at that and say, hey, check, they're good, they're good. They, they, they pass. They made a passing grade, so they're okay. Maybe you've believed that. That's a lie straight out of hell. That is a lie straight out of hell. Your being right with God is about you receiving the forgiveness that is offered by the person of the Lord Jesus who died on the cross for your sins and trusting that His blood is sufficient to atone for the penalty that was assigned to you because of your sin, and, and for you to receive the gift of eternal life that comes through belief on His name. Maybe today is the day of days in your life where you need to come to Christ, where you need to say yes to Jesus, who said yes to the cross for you. Maybe today you need to accept Him and trust Him. If that's so, if that's true of you, in just a few moments we'll give you the opportunity to acknowledge that, to, to get help with that. Uh, we're we're going to have an opportunity for you to meet with one of our ministers and just to share with them, you know, I, today is the day that I want to explore what it means to receive Christ, what it means to be saved, what it means to know Him in my heart, what it means to be forgiven of my sin. And we'll help you with that. We will help you with that. So if, if, you, need to, if you need to explore that, would you come and visit with one of our ministers in just a moment after we pray and when we begin to just listen for the voice of God? Maybe you're here today and there are other things. Maybe, maybe you've been trying to live a life of obedience, but you haven't come to the place of surrender. And today you just need to say, you know what, Lord, I want, I want to just surrender my life in all of its parts to you. Just say, here I am, Lord. It's not about rules for me anymore. I'm not trying to just keep a commandment and not, and not break a commandment. But I want to know you. And I want to walk into the fullness of that relationship through surrender of my very life to you today. If you need one of us to pray with you about that, we're happy to do that as well. Maybe God's leading you to unite with this church family in just a few moments. We'll give you the chance to, to make that move and to say, you know, here we are, to be a church family to you and to welcome you into this fellowship, to encourage you, to pray with you, to support you, to try to help you learn what it means to know the Lord. Anything that God's speaking to you about today, in just a few moments, that'll be the opportunity you have, if you need help with that, to visit with us, and we'll be glad to do that. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. As I pray, you just pray and ask the Lord to speak to your own heart. Father, in Jesus' name, we come now. We ask that in the quietness of these moments, 
that we would hear your voice, that we would sense you confirming what is truth, that we would sense you reminding us of the love of God for every one of us and of the great work that you've accomplished through your son, Jesus. And Father, if there's anyone in this room today that needs to receive Christ, that needs to experience the forgiveness of their sin, that needs the mercy of God brought to bear on their lives, I pray they would say yes to to you today. Father, if there's anything else that we need to do in order to be obedient, to be surrendered, may we do that as well. Would you stand to your feet with your heads bowed and just listening quietly for the voice of God. If you need to come, our ministers are down front. Happy to greet you, happy to pray with you, visit with you about anything that we possibly can, anything that you need. You come today. If you want to unite with this church, now's the time to step out. If you want to say yes to Jesus, you come, and we'll be happy to visit with you about that. Whatever God's leading you to do, we're here for you.